new day for the woman. to patriarchy falls. Lift every voice, sing, spread your wings, cut the strings, take a swing, fight to fight. The past is left, light a light. Find the stars held by night. The woman can't be dimmed or shunned. They ask for light, we gave them sons. Our power comes tongue in cheek. What man will stand, speak aloud the anthem for woman?
came upon a man who carried in his fist all of the violence that happened to him through many a day he locked it away and hardened his flesh like no weapon could prosper they put him in a cage and said it was his fate to ride with the rest but he got out in a he puts on a mask now to cover his rage Cause red and blue lights might look twice And bring the chopper today He wanted to break down He wanted to test the ground I said how do we defeat that state that do evil deal He said practice what you preach Good evening, everyone. Welcome, 2021 Winter Jazz Fest. Uh, this is our 17th season. We are certainly sad we can't all be together in person. Uh, we miss your faces, we miss your energy, we miss all the venues and all the musicians. Um, we miss this New York streets and hopping around between venues and uh, all of the hangs. So we're gonna hang here online. Um, we are thrilled to launch 2021 Winter Jazz Fest. We started last night with this talk series. This is our second night, our second conversation. Um, I want to, uh, first of all, thank um, everyone in advance for being here uh, for us and helping with the continuity of Winter Jazz Fest. Um, we aim, of course, to be back together next year. We hope we will all be able to do that. Um, although we can't all be together, we do have a continued commitment to bringing together folks in dynamic conversations and to expand the jazz community uh, and to showcase new voices here. Um, and ideally to be a beacon um, aligning messages of social justice into our programming. Uh, we were thrilled about uh, four years ago to be approached by the Key Change Organization uh, in England, um, asking us to be one of the first uh, US festivals to commit to Key Change, uh, which was advocating for gender parity in programming. And we were thrilled to give it a go. The, the, um, the ask was to pledge that by the year 2022, we have gender parity in our programming. We did the calculations in, in that first year 2018, sorry, 2017, we had already met those guidelines. Uh, and we continued in 2018 and 2019 uh, and 2020. Um, and our programming uh, fits that as well here. Uh, but beyond just the key change, um, uh, the key change initiative, we were, uh, we knew it was important to have conversations 
Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute, and I'm happy to introduce our host. Um, but before we get there, I want to just remind everyone of another initiative that we're, we're thrilled to support. Uh, early in the pandemic, myself and um, uh, jazz professionals Danny Melnick and Gail Boyd uh, started this organization called Jazz Coalition. And uh, the goal was to raise funds to support artists in this time of need and give, um, uh, give grants, commission grants to musicians to create works that represent these times. We raised over $100,000 in a relatively short time and granted 100 artists. Um, and we're continuing to raise money now. Uh, we'd, like, we'd love to continue to support artists in this way with commission grants. So if you can, if you're able to, uh, go to jazzcoalition.org. There's a donate button. Uh, there's uh, ways you can support. Uh, we want to keep this music moving forward, of course, and reminding artists, musicians of their value and worth, um, especially during these interesting, momentous times. Um, I also want to ask if you're if you're interested, uh, if you're on social media and you have memories, photos, videos from past years, share them uh, with the hashtag uh, missingwjf and tag us at nycwjf. And we will share those as well throughout the entire month. Our programming continues uh, tomorrow, actually, with uh, an exciting event uh, we're uh, presenting with Summer Stage and the People's Voices uh, of the History of the United States. Um, it will be at 7 p.m. on the Summer Stage uh, website and on their Facebook page. We'll also be cross-posting on Winter Jazz Fest site. And it will feature performances and speeches um, including performers Brandy Younger, Lakeisha Benjamin, uh, Ty Jones, Mahogany Brown, Diva Mahal, uh, Tank from Tank and the Bangas, C. Anthony Bryant with Russell Hall, and others. Uh, so please join us then. And then our conversation series uh, will continue into February. Um, we are going to premiere a, uh, a conversation series that Leila Hathaway is hosting with special guests to be announced. And then um, our jazz and gender conversations will continue in February and March, as will our um, Fertile Grounds series uh, curated by Nama Sof Sophia Sandy um, that we launched last night and uh, hope to see you all there. But without further ado, I wanna kick this off and bring or pass the mic to a musician, an educator, uh, a dear friend and someone I deeply respect and grateful that she can be part of our uh, our team here at Winter Jazz Fest. Please welcome Sarah Elizabeth Charles. Thanks, Bryce. Hey, everybody. So good to see so many people here on Facebook and here on Zoom. A special welcome to our Winter Jazz Fest audience, as well as students uh, from Berkeley, from the New School, from the Clive Davis Institute at NYU. We can't see you, see you, but we see you. We feel you here with us. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and welcome to the Jazz and Gender and End to Norms talk series event. Um, please feel free, I just wanna say throughout the course of this event, please feel free to comment and ask questions in the chat throughout the event tonight. Um, it's gonna be my responsibility as the host to field questions both from the chat on Facebook Live and the chat on Zoom. Uh, so you can put thoughts or questions there anytime you want. And we're gonna have a time for responses toward the end of the event. So today's talk will be one of three conversations as Bryce mentioned around gender that will be taking place over the next three months. And I wanted to just take a second and give a little bit more context as to how we got here today and why we think that these conversations are necessary and important. Um, Winter Jazz Fest has been centering talk series events around gender as Bryce mentioned also for the past three years. This is the fourth year um, with many different participants from many different backgrounds and realms of experience from musicians to activists to scholars to journalists to programmers. Um, and these events have taken place that have taken place thus far have sparked conversations around gender and black American music as they relate to programming choices, cultural con constructions, allyhood, language, education, and much more. Now, given the remote nature of things in this unique and difficult moment in time, this is the first year that we're having the opportunity to have three conversations centered on gender during this talk series. And I've worked with Bryce and Nyama uh, Sandy to de on developing this year's series of talks. And I'm so grateful to have input from both of them, 
from our partners who I'll introduce in a little bit, from talk series participants and many other members of this really fast growing community of individuals working to expand this conversation and delve deeper into productive and informative dialogue around this subject. Uh, I also just wanna give a huge thanks to our participants today who you'll meet very soon and also to Naomi Extra and Toshi Regan and many others who have been so willing to contribute ideas throughout the course of this process. Um, we are not doing this alone. There are so many people who are not here today who you can't see who have contributed so much um, to this subject, to these conversations and to this dialogue um, on an ongoing basis. And it's so important that we communicate and are in touch with one another in regards to moving this conversation and the culture of this music forward um, as it relates to gender equity and, and the marginaliza marginalization that has existed for so many years. Um, so in saying this, I just wanted to share a little bit more about the partners for this particular series of events. Um, so our first partner, the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music at the College of Performing Arts at the New School is both my alma mater and where I work currently as an adjunct professor. Um, and proudly, um, the jazz and gender course that I designed is something that was launched four years ago. And I now co-teach that course with saxophonist, vocalist, composer, and educator, Caroline Davis. I've been working really closely with Dean Keller Croker, Amanda Eckery, Gina Izzo, Iris Menza, and uh, and many others on the Jazz and Gender series in an effort to provide a safe space for, uh, for culturally and environmentally productive conversations. Really, that's the best way to say it, um, specifically around gender in the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music and COPA, the College of Performing Arts. The School of Jazz and Contemporary Music and the College of Performing Arts started partnering with Winter Jazz Fest in this effort in the spring of 2020. And we're super happy to be doing this yet again for this series of three events. Our second partner today is the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. We're so grateful to Asia Burrell Wood and Terry Lynn Carrington, who is one of our participants in today's talk. So you'll see Terry Lynn in a bit. Um, we're so grateful to both of them for agreeing to build this, this series of events together this year. Asia actually just shared an article a little while ago um, from an, uh, an amazing team of journalists at NPR and Winter Jazz Test, I believe shared this recently too. Um, that stated until 2019, out of the top 50 albums each year, the share of women led and co-led projects never ranged above 20%. We're at about 34% in 2019. And we believe that this forward movement is really due to conversations like this and the work of both individuals and institutions. So the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, I'll tell you a little bit about the Institute. It was originally founded in 2018 by Terry Lynn Carrington, so about four years ago. Oh, I'm sorry, not about four years ago, in 2018. <laughs> and has a mission of recruiting, teaching, mentoring, and advocating for musicians seeking to study jazz with gender and racial justice as guiding principles. Their values of imagination, equity, freedom, ownership, all of these help to facilitate the fostering of creative practice and scholarship in jazz within an integrated and egalitarian setting. They specifically seek to engage the pursuit of jazz without patriarchy, that's the goal, and in making a long-lasting long -lasting cultural and long-standing cultural shifts in jazz and other music communities, recognizing the role that jazz can play in a larger struggle for gender and racial justice and equity. The Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice is the first of its kind. We've never seen anything like this in Black American music. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and we're so grateful to have them as a partner for the curation of this series and in the conversations moving forward. So I've talked a lot um, and I'm beyond excited to stop talking and to take a back seat in today's conversation, but I do have one more introduction to make before we begin, um, which is our moderator introduction. I'm pleased and honored to introduce Brooklyn-based sound artist and composer and educator Faye Victor as our moderator today. Faye's creative approach is unlike any musician I've come across. Her ability to freely express by way of her seemingly unlimited instrument always leaves me stunned, touch, touched, and intensely affected. Um, her improvising quartet, Sound Noise Funk's most recent release, we've had, we've we've had enough is a cry of frustration with the state of our country, along with a communication of de determination to do something about it while celebrating the power and joy of spontaneous creativity. Faye has also recently been focused on her Mutations for Justice project, which is a rolling diary of the Trump administration using 
small compositional mantras and a minimalist framework built upon repetition and developed through improvisation. It is a work in progress, as she has shared with me. And it, when, when it's finished, it will be a collection of 45 pieces written about and in response to this president's time in office. It was performed at Winter Jazz Fest actually two years ago in an earlier iteration and continues to be developed by Faye. Now, would you please join me in welcoming the incomparable Faye Victor as our moderator for tonight. Oh, thank you, Sarah. What a lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a joy to be here and an honor. Um, I am so honored to be here this evening um, and to sort of guide and sort of start some questions around the conversation of gender and the end to norms, as, as this talk is, is called. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists for this talk and um, I'm gonna do it alphabetically um, you know, I, I just thought that was the first way to do it. So I'm going to start with uh, mentioning, uh, Terry, with, with introducing Terry Lynn Carrington, who's an American jazz drummer, composer, producer, educator, and activist. She's played with Dizzy Gillespie, Stan Getz, Clark Terry, Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Joe Sample, Al Jarreau, and many, many others. She's toured with each of Hancock's musical configurations between 1997 and 2007. Terry Lynn Carrington is also a band leader uh, in her own right and has already gotten garnered three Grammy Grammys for her work. Um, she's currently up for her fourth Grammy for her, for her recording Waiting Game with her latest project, Social Science. Terry is also a 2019 Doris Duke Award recipient and a 2021 NEA Jazz Master. Please welcome Terry Lynn Carrington. Thank you, Terry. Um, I'm going to welcome welcome Terry. Great to see you. You as well. Um, yeah. Um, and our next panelist is Maureen Mann. Maureen Mann is a cultural anthropologist whose research interests include African American music and culture, the construction and performance of race and gender in music, and the relationship between race, class, generation, and culture. She teaches courses on the history of rock and roll, music, and the construction of race, fieldwork methods, and the African American and African American women and music. She's the author of two books: Black Diamond Queens, African American Women and Rock and Roll, Duke University Press 2020, and Right to Rock: The Black Rock Coalition and the Cultural Politics of Race, Duke University Press 2004. Please welcome Maureen Mann. Hi, Faye. Hi. Thank you for that introduction. Oh, you're quite welcome. Welcome. Uh, great having you here. Welcome. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to introduce some more Pinda Hughes, who is a composer, pianist, vocalist known for large multidisciplinary projects and for using music to examine socio-political issues. He's performed at the Kennedy Center, Sundance Film Festival, Carnegie Hall and MoMA, and has toured internationally with Bradford Marsalis, Christian Scott Common, and Emily King. He's the first ever Art for Justice plus Soros Justice Fellow in support of his upcoming The Healing Project and a 2019 Creative Capital Guarantee grantee. PBS NewsHour has said composer and artist Samora Abayomi Pinderhughes wants to make music that makes listeners live differently. Welcome, Samora Pinderhughes. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Honored to be here with everybody. Welcome. Um, so, so just to kind of give a little sort of a, a, um, outline of how, how to start things off, I've, I've sort of garnered a few questions, some general questions to start the conversation going. I also have some specific questions for each of you, each of the panelists, for, for Terry, uh, Maureen, and Samora. And, um, and some, so, but, you know, I'm really open um, to kind of just take the conversation where it goes. So I'm um, not beholden to anything. Um, just kind of want to make sure that we cover. And, and if you have any, um, yeah, if anything you want to make sure that you talk about and mention, please, please be sure to, um, to either let me know in the chat if, if, if you don't get to say it um, outright. 
And, um, and, if, and if for some reason in the introduction, I left out something that you feel is really important to share with everyone, um, please, please feel free to do so as well. Um, and, 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 and without any further ado, I do have a question to start things off. Um, this is for everyone and please feel free to, um, yeah, whoever wants to come to the floor or come to the center and answer this is totally okay, it's, it's fine. Um, so the first question is, <clears throat> what do you feel are the norms that have been historically established today in relation to jazz and Black American music and gender? Uh, well, nobody's stepping in, so I guess I will. <laughs> um, I mean, the norms, you know, the way I look at it, that word normal is just a setting on a dryer. You know, that's kind of my relationship to the word. Um, I don't believe in it, uh, but mm -hmm. there are certain things, of course, you know, uh, stereotypically that we experience and see um, in the music field in general and uh, specifically in jazz. Uh, of course, there's the gendering of instruments. Um, you know, what's what women should play or what they shouldn't play, that's more like it. Um, yes. And then there's the stereotyping of who plays, um, you know, the assumption that it's not appropriate for women to, to play and, you know, there's not appropriate for women to be in this environment, mm -hmm. um, being on the road, uh, being on tour buses, being out late at night, being in clubs, you know, those kinds of things that have carried over for, you know, decades and decades. Um, and, you know, of course, there's the sexual uh, objectification of, of women that plays a large role in all of this mm -hmm. um, and it hasn't traditionally been, you know, any kind of system of checks and balances for the road. Um, you know, there's no HR and uh, there's nobody that's going to necessarily get in trouble uh, for acting inappropriately. Yeah. Um, so all of this stuff has been normal, you know, to me. Um, and along with the idea that men created the music, um, mm -hmm. which also I think um, there's still a lot of corrective work to be done there to acknowledge so many of the women that have been erased. Um, yes. And then looking at you know, the reasons of why, you know, why um, there aren't and haven't been as many women, not just acknowledged, but even uh, earlier on doing it um, so I think those are all the things that we're you know, trying to address with ending norms. Yes, I'm really, um, wow, you, you, you said a, a lot of, of, um, of, of things that are sort of definitely established as sort of just to consider normal as a way of conducting oneself as a jazz musician or the scene. Um, it's funny when you talk about that the music is, starts with men. Um, I'm just going to interject this. One thing I've been talking about a lot this year is that actually I feel this music is built on Black women's voices. Like this is this is what this music is built on, and so um, it's such a great discussion to have in and of itself. You know, well, I meant to so, say that it's a myth. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I totally I understood out. you. Yeah, <laughs> okay. no, no, I totally understood. You know that that sense that that that's where it starts. You know. And, um, and, and also just to kind of just quickly say that I think it took me a long time to realize that that's, you know, to kind of put the pieces together of how, how much of a myth it is. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, Maureen or Samora, do you want to chime in on, on that? Yeah, I, I wanted to, I was going to say something about women's voices, Faye, and I think um, one of the norms is the expectation that is that if there is a woman involved in jazz, then she is a vocalist. And that's sort of a, a, an okay or an appropriate place for a woman to be in that world. But then at the same time, I think women's vocal labor and innovation isn't really recognized. And so those women vocalists aren't treated as musicians. Um, they could almost be talked about as girl singers who don't really know what they're doing. When in fact, they're making musical choices, they're arranging their vocals, uh, they're making decisions, decisions that are artistic and creative. And so I think we also want to talk about that norm of um, really not honoring the labor of women, the ones who came way before, whose names we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and also the fact that when we talk about 
instrumentalists, one of the ways we compliment them is by saying, we talk about their voices and how they're able to approximate a human voice, especially with horn players. Um, so we, we need to think about where that human voice might have begun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I, 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 just to speak to that a little, um, at least in, you know, when I started out as a jazz, I mean, I'm a jazz vocalist, at least that's, that's where I'm coming from. But one of the things that was very clear was that the instrumentalists learned from the vocalists. I mean, like I was talking about Lester Young and Billie Holiday, such a, um, so it's in the beginning, that was where they got their sound from, you know? So uh, this is just such a great conversation already. Um, thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Samora, would you like, is there anything you'd like to add to this sure. conversation? Sure, sure. Um... Yeah, uh, definitely echoing all the sentiments that have been said. And also just want to say, you know, honored to be um, on this panel with these illustrious folks who I, I respect so deeply. Um, and, uh, you know, um, just thinking specifically about the question itself, because I, I love language and that's why I really love um, the way that uh, Terry started, you know, actually speaking about the word itself, norms. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is that when we think about this question of an end to norms in the music, that's an American question as well, right? So any norms that are a part of the music are a part of the American project. Um, and so this is a thing for all of us to, um, to deal with and protect, particularly for, for us men to, um, to dismantle the ways that we on the daily participate in um, patriarchy and misogyny. I also, when you um, when you think about when I think about gender and end to norms, I think about an end to the norm of gender, or the way the ways that many of us practice or think of the fixity of gender. Um, so you know, thinking about representing and making space for trans folks in this music, um, you know, representing and making space for folks who choose to be fluid in their gender, um, you know, thinking about the ways that we perform gender and which parts are, uh, which parts of those performances and which parts of the ways that we actually present both to ourselves and others are things that we are doing on an active basis that's like positive and affirming both to ourselves and others and which parts mm -hmm. we've just inherited and then are practicing without thinking about it, you know? And particularly again, for us men, that's a lot of stuff. And I don't mean a lot of times when, a lot of times when it's presented in the, the common or popular cultural discourse, it's the most um, extreme forms when we talk about um, misogyny or patriarchy, it's mm -hmm. about the, the, what I call the loudest of violences, but there's quiet violence as well, you know? And, and there's other ways of, of perpetuating um, power dynamics, there's other ways of silencing people, there's other ways of um, being very unhealthy in context of conflict that are um, things that we've really inherited through the generations. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to kind of participate collectively and individually in dismantling over time. Um, and I think um, that's a big part of the work as well. And particularly, as I said, the work that we as men have to do. The other um, last thing I would I would say is that um, I think a thing that I've encountered a lot is this energy. Um, and I was just thinking about this today as I was thinking about this um, this topic or this conversation is mm -hmm. this energy that in order to make space for a new way of relating that is uh, taking into context um, the like making a space healthy for all people um, and, and not like a male dominated kind of misogynist space, it's presented very often the energy is like that the shift is something that will change the air in the room or that, that, that will somehow make things like we can't, we can't be ourselves or we can't talk regular. Or, and, and my thinking on that is like, so what you're saying is you can't be yourself if you don't get rid of your, the worst parts of you. Like that doesn't make sense to me, you know? Um, and so for me, I think that's a thing that we have to think deeper about as mm -hmm. just a, something we, we, we accept of, you know, men saying, oh, well, if we're, we're changing the ways that we behave, you know, 
that's going to put us on edge. It's just, it's a little bit of a BS thing to me. To yeah, me. I, I think, well, thank you. Wow, that was a very, very thorough, um, you know, thorough thoughts on, on well, especially, it's, you know, especially around patriarchy and, and how, um, how that affects um, the music and how it affects how we interact with each other. I think, um, well, I, I, full disclosure, because I'm not, I haven't mentioned this yet, and I think it's maybe a good time to mention this. Um, I've gotten to know Terry Lynn in the past few years because we are um, both members of the We Have Voice Collective that sort of um, put together the code of conduct for the performing arts. Um, and, and part of that document was to incorporate all sorts of interactions, including power dynamics, um, including um, the fact that all people can be bullied, all people can get hurt, all, you know, um, and not sort of make it just a sort of, uh, just a purely gender-based um, document. Wouldn't you, would you, would you agree, Terry? Um, yeah, um, I, do, I do agree. And that also is making me think about, uh, just to follow up to what Samora said um, about men dealing with their participation in patriarchy. Um, I just wanted to throw in there too, that women have to also look at their participation in patriarchy, um, as well as uh, the trans women and men, mm -hmm. because I mean, some uh, trans men are just, you know, as much misogynist as uh, cisgendered men. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, we look at these things, but, you know, we all have to address them within ourselves. I think uh, before we can even really start to uh, deal with it on a larger level. Um, and I know for me, I've been trying to do that a lot more recently, like looking at how I benefit from a patriarchal or a sexist or racist um, culture, you know, how, mm -hmm. how that's played a role um, in not just my thinking, but just in um, you know, other areas of my life over the years, um, which is, I think, why what, you know, one of the things that led me to the work that I'm trying to do now, which is all still new, a bit new to me, uh, meaning like, you know, the last five or six years is kind of when I started thinking more seriously um, mm -hmm. about this problem of, of gender. Um, and also I wanted to say um, something that Maureen uh, mentioned, she, you said uh, girl singers. And I was so happy to hear you say girl singers because often uh, people say chick singers and it always just, you know, <laughs> it's, such, it's <laughs> terrible. So like Samora was mentioning too, language is so, important mm -hmm. there were so many things that we i think we have to um unlearn and, and challenge ourselves you know to uh because there's some people that, that they're just resistant especially even when it comes to pronouns right um yeah. we have a few uh students um uh, in in our institute uh that's pronouns are they or theirs and there's still you know teachers at the college that are a bit resistant or just difficult for them and you know, I often think about when somebody gets married and changes their last name, it's not so difficult for you to now call this person by a different last name. So mm -hmm. uh, that's just a you know, small example that, uh, so anyway, thank you for uh, both of you for mentioning language because it's uh, really important. Yeah, it, it, it is. Thank you, thank you, Terry, for saying that. It, and um, and I, will, I would argue that um, since I'm a girl singer, I'd argue that that has, I will, that has changed. I think um, I think vocalists are taking a lot more agency now, um, and and asserting them, themselves and their and their artistry and their artistic voice, um, and uh, and I'm I'm really grateful to to have lived through through that because I've I've been at this close to thirty years, so it's it's really nice to kind of see that come to this place where. That's, that has really changed, um, thankfully. Um, I wanna, um, I would like to add, follow up with another question if that's all right, unless anyone wants to say anything more about what we've been, what we started, which is already like a great conversation. But I would like to, um, you know, as part of this, this discussion around the end, end to norms, um, how do each of you see your role in ending the norms? And Terry, you've already started speaking a little bit about that, that have been established around gender in jazz and Black American music. 
specifically and other genres of music that apply to your creative practice? Sure, I'll go. Um, I, uh, well, first of all, um, on the subject um, of Terry, I, you know, and I, I, I'm somebody that believes in giving people, they say, well, give people your flowers while you're here, right? So, you know, Terry has been number one, a very important person in both my and also my sister's life, as well as, um, you know, many, many friends and family, folks I would consider family. Um, as as a as a mentor, a, a band person, you know, a person that we look up to, and just somebody that has really been there for many people, musically and personally. So, just want to commend you, and also in the context of of the Berkeley, um, you know, uh, center, the the institute that you guys have created. I've thought, you know, recently a lot about this. That one of the most difficult and most essential things that we need right now is for people to be building things, to be making space for people to to build the house and then make it available for people to live in to, to experience to grow you know and so i also just commend you and thank you for for making that space for so many people um for building it so to speak i don't even like put the bricks but you know building it making it available for the folks um as far as um the question of how i'm trying to to do that um as terry said i think the first part comes with holding myself accountable um, and I think that, um, as she mentioned, this, this has been an interesting year this past year, um, us having to all be in the house or wherever we are, you know, not everyone is fortunate to have a, a home, but, you know, being, uh, you know, very still in certain ways, much more than usual, um, definitely has given me occasion to have a lot of time to think and a lot of time to start to try to, you know, do more and more work in deconstructing, like I said, the, the, the inherited um, ways that, that even I, you know, perpetuate um, mm -hmm. patriarchy and misogyny. Um, and so that's very interesting. And I see it in like all different types of places, you know, in intimate relations, in the ways that I uh, react uh, to conflict, um, in the ways that I like operate um, when I'm around certain people, particularly other men, the things I'll say, the things I won't say, the way I'll change my language. So those are the things I'm trying to not do. Um, and I think that that's a, just like going to the gym or practicing your instrument, it's, a, it's an everyday thing, right? Mm -hmm. You put the time in. Um, so that's one. I think the other, you know, as somebody who's also um, not only trying to understand the history of the music, but the history of the black radical tradition in general, in gender, in mm -hmm. not in gender, in general, <laughs> um, uh, and in gender. But um, uh, and you guys have all, uh, you, you all have mentioned, not you guys, you all have mentioned um, that uh, you know you've talked about that in respect to the music, but I think it's also the case in um, respect to the black radical tradition in general, when it comes to organizing, when it comes to politics, you know, we've we had an uprising this past summer. A lot of mm -hmm. people are coming back to the black radical tradition as a space of, of um, an oasis of possibility of truth, you know, the writings of people, the work people have done. And um, that is a space built by black queer women, you know, and there's so, that's also another thing that is not, um, represented folks always going back to, you know, and I'm the biggest Baldwin fan in the world, but, you know, and, and MLK and all the rest, but, you know, but the Kambahi River Collective mm -hmm. exists mm -hmm. and, you know, Lucy Parsons exists and Johnny Tillman exists and uh, Ella Baker, you know, there's all these folks that are really foundational in the black radical tradition, mm -hmm. not to mention, um, you know, the the defund the police movement, no matter who you how you think about it, and I support it because I'm an abolitionist. Uh, those ideas, you know, um, built by folks like Miriam Kaba, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Angela Davis, you know, um, you know, I mean, they're communal ideas, but the writings themselves, the ideas. So, anyways, um, you know, I, I try to, I think, be transparent and to share that information um, with others and with myself as far as really just being on Front Street about, listen, like our, our inherited practice in all the ways is thanks to Black queer people. <laughs> um, so 
So we have to uh, represent, and uh, that's a part of shifting that power dynamic as well, to pretend that things are always built by men when they almost never are. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Wow, thank you for saying that, Samar. Wow, um, Maureen, do you wanna do you want to answer or, or talk to speak to this? What do you feel? Um, how do you see your role in ending norms and the norms that have been established? Uh, well, I have the privilege of being a professor, so my my job and my privilege is to teach, and I um, I teach in a department of music, and. Um, I really try to teach some of this history, African-American history, uh, and to situate it in a way where we're thinking intersectionally. So we're thinking about gender and race and class and sexuality together and how these are you know, mutually building and creating and constructing each other. Um, I like to teach about how music helps us construct our understanding of race um, you know, so starting out thinking about how minstrelsy has been so formative in the United States in constructing ideas of what blackness even is and that those are norms that, that we all um, have to contend with. Um, but in terms of talking more specifically about gender, I, I do want us to, you know, in, in teaching my courses, I want our, stu our students to think about gender is not something that women have. Um, gender is uh, something that we are all we all experience. And I think those ideas are actually much more easy for students to understand now than they mm -hmm. were when I started teaching uh, a little more than 20 years ago. So that because we're thinking about things like um, trans people, that was something that was never discussed before. So I think students are really more open to, to these ideas um, and, and wrestling with them. Um, but I think the other thing with, you know, teaching about or, or trying to end the norms is to end a kind of narrative of great men who created the music, of really whatever genre you're talking about, because I think in any musical genre you're dealing with, maybe with the exception of gospel music, where people will allow that, yes, women were the real movers and shakers in that, um, in that genre. Um, you, you, you have to really make space for talking about women and not just, you know, one week out of the semester, but to really mm -hmm. understand how gender shaped women's experiences and access or limits, uh, limit to access, uh, and then how they still, in many cases, were able to make their voices heard or make their, make their music heard. Um, so I try to make that a piece of my teaching. Mm -hmm. And for me to be able to teach it, I have to learn it. And so I'm always trying to learn more about, um, for me, you know, I'm, I'm most interested in women, um, how women have contributed. Uh, so that's, you know, really for me, part of the fun is to learn about these artists and what they did. And in some cases, you know, try to understand why they sort of disappeared, why we don't, why they aren't part of the canon. So I think pushing, you know, pushing against the canon and trying to create a new understanding uh, of the history. Yeah, that's a, the, thank you, thank you so much for 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 talking about that, especially the context of how, um, even though some female artists are acknowledged or women artists are acknowledged, that the labor and how and how and the odds of actually getting to the you know the point that you would actually even be seen and and taken seriously, um, that's such a good point. And I think, you know, speaking, this idea of speaking of what we can all do, I think I forget that myself sometimes, like, you know, um, that, you know, I, I think we all work hard, but sometimes I think I lose the context that, yeah, as certainly as, as a woman, and especially maybe perhaps as a woman of color, um, we always have to work so much harder um, just, just to be seen, you know, just to, um, and so the ones that are successful, you can only imagine. Um, you know, so that's a really, really good point. I think um, many of us, you know, don't think about. Yeah. You know. And uh, uh, if I can even just throw something, um, Terry, are you going to say something? No, 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 go ahead. Um, no, because because I was actually thinking a lot about there's this idea, and you know, um, this is idea that our labor, as especially as 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 Black women, that our labor, if we are successful, there's also this other side of it that we are 
of course, you know, like, of course, because you have this a sort of natural, uh, intuitive uh, talent, right? Um, but if other communities are successful with the same thing, that that's kind of taken much more seriously because that sort of natural, you know, so I just kind of wanted to, because sometimes I think that's the other side of it too. Um, and that's kind of a, another form of erasure, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, um, I don't know. I, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think you just brought up a whole nother <laughs> conversation <laughs> that we could, of course, dive into. Um, <laughs> When other communities do it, it, it's it's valid, and you know, yeah. when certain communities do it, it's natural and instinctual, yeah. and all of that. But anyway, um, I just kind of wanted to, um, you know, ask Maureen um, two things that you said that uh, I would love for you to, to expand on. Um, when you said uh, gender is uh, something we all experience, not something that women have. Um, I think it, you know, it would be really beneficial for you to maybe speak a little bit more on that. And also um, something you said that made me think, um, you said uh, music teaches, uh, teaches us what blackness is or teaches society what blackness is. And um, I, it made me think about hip hop and how um, so much of you know, our, our, the world sees that as being uh, you know, black, that's, that's what black people are. That's, you know, that's what, what they're talking about is what we all experience and who we all are. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I, I think I constantly find myself pushing back on that, even though I embrace mm -hmm. hip hop, um, it just does not define, uh, you know, us all. Um, and then it made me think about women, if that's true, what you said, then it made me think about women and, uh, or, you know, anybody on the gender spectrum other than men, uh, what music is teaching uh, the world or society about women. Because I couldn't even think, you know, like when you said that, I was like, oh, I can't think of any examples, like, other than, you know, what, a, a singer that's waifish or something. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the, you know, like, what is, what is being taught about women through music? Um, so I would love for you to speak a little more on that person. I'll, I'll try. Um, I think with to respond to the last part of your question, to think about constructions of race through music, I think part of, one of the norms that I find so frustrating is how limited the representation of Blackness is in the media generally. So it, it's just, there are just a couple of narratives that we have and we expect people to fit into those narratives. And if they don't, we, we basically just, we can't deal with them. It's very hard to make sense of them. Um, and I think that's also, so I think that's the, the case with music. Um, I focus in my research on musicians who, because of their race and their musical genre, they don't fit into the expected slot because they're black people and they're playing rock. And so they, 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 they aren't legible is, is one way to think about it. Um, so I think one of the, you know, one of the goals is to try to, to hear more stories or to hear more possibilities in what people, um, you know, what specifically people of African descent do musically. Um, in terms of, you know, gender or in terms of women of African descent or women of color, I think the, the image in the, in the mainstream of media and probably not so much in jazz because jazz isn't um, commercialized in quite the same way, but in pop music and, and hip hop, you know, the, the dominant image of women is a very sexualized image. It's, it's very hard to get away from that. And I think if you're not putting that image out, it's hard for you to get very far um, in the industry in some way that that's, you, you've got to be working in that, in that realm. It has a lot to do with visual presentation. Um, um, so I think that that's one of the, so if, if it's not wayfish, if it's not the wayfish woman, then it's a, it's a very sexualized woman. Um, and then in terms of uh, gender construction, um, I'm not remembering exactly how you phrased the question, Terry, uh, but just the idea that 
Um, I think so, kind of responding, kind of thinking along the lines of what uh, Samora was saying that sometimes women, uh, I mean, sometimes when we're talking about what's going to be taught, uh, what's going to be on the syllabus, uh, a male professor might say, well, gender, that's, that's not really for, I don't really know anything about that. That's not my area. Um, it doesn't really have, it's not something for me to do. That's mm -hmm. you all can take care of that. Um, and so we've been using the word patriarchy. Um, that's a very patriarchal move to make, but it's a move that can be made without awareness because you're, you know, you're in that position of power. So you, right. you know, you don't have, you don't have to do that work. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that's one way to, to say it, to, to be in that position is a gendered position. Um, and the, the need is for people who are in that position as Samora, I'm, I think I'm saying what Samora said in a different way, is to, mm -hmm. is to recognize that and to acknowledge that and then hopefully to move, you know, away from that uh, in a different direction. But um, I, I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist, so I see things as these things are enculturated. They're very hard to move away from and they're very ingrained in all of us, as I think we've said earlier, um, it's not just men who do patriarchy. We're all taught to do it because that's how the system runs. Um, it's not just white people who do racism. It's systemic racism. We are taught, we, we are, and we're in these structures and it's very hard to get out of them. It's very, so it, that's what makes it so important to teach about them and learn to recognize them so that you can, so we can start to dismantle them, to recognize that they're constructed, they're not natural, mm -hmm. and then to do the work to, to try to dismantle them. That would have been my follow-up question. How do we start to dismantle and how do we start to, um, yeah, how, how do we start to have these conversations where, um, where, it becomes, where it becomes normal to see everything, um, to not sort of categorize everything in the way we've been doing for so long. And as you said, it's such an entrenched, um, yeah, but if you could speak more to that, it'd be really interesting to hear, but yeah. Yeah, I would just say quickly is, is to, to try to recognize how these things are produ produced. And I think that it calls us to do a lot of historical work. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting. Um, I'll make an allusion to what's going on outside of this panel. Um, in the United States, history is not really taught very well. So we really, don't, it, 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 it's a long time before, you have to go through a lot of school, I think, before you start learning the history of this country. But, you know, if, you, if you're taught one version of that history, um, it can be hard to have these conversations or hear these critiques because um, you've been taught a certain type of narrative of, of the United States. Um, the one that begins in 1620, there's another narrative, the one that the New York Times did their um, piece, mm -hmm. I guess, last year on 1619. There's another narrative of the United States. Um, and so we, ha we have to learn that history um, as, we're, as we're learning the history of these specific musical genres, because the people who are creating this music were creating them in a historical context. And that context affected what they were able to do, what their limits were, how they were heard or not heard. So I think history is just really, really important, both musical history and then just our, our national history. And then we can also think globally because this isn't, you know, we, we, we need to think globally at, at this moment. Wow, thank you. That was um, really informative and I think really helpful. And, and Terry, I thank you for sort of asking Maureen to unpack more of, um, um, yeah, talking about ending, ending gender uh, ending how we look at gender and deal with it especially in relationship to um music and and how um and how we're all sort of culpable maybe is that is that i don't know if that's a good word um at least in terms of how in sort of taking care of and being responsible for how we 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 change for change in, in ourselves I, um i'll just yeah and, and if it's from my own work, I'll say that um, when I started as a jazz musician, the idea of having, even just having women in the band with me was 
not it wasn't a, like not so much the interesting thing it wasn't a bad or a good idea it just wasn't it just didn't wasn't an idea it was you know it's really interesting and it was a certain moment when I, it really hit me that why 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 not um, and since then, it, that has changed. Um, but it's but it's a really interesting thing. It's like you you can just exist and not even think about it. And even though in a lot of other ways I might have thought, okay, I'm doing certainly progressing and trying to be behaving in a, in a way that I feel is will move things along in, in a way that I can feel good about. But that was not that was just sort of a big blind spot. So so this is such an important conversation to have and just to be reminded that. Um, we're all in this and we're all uh, part of it and, and in the dismantling of it too. Thank you. I want to apologize because something's going on with my computer. Yeah, I was going to ask, is everything falling. okay? Is, I know, right? <laughs> Would you? Uh, it seems like it's overheating. So um, if this happens again, I'll sign on with my phone. Okay. Just so you know, but I just what? also wanted to say one thing. I missed obviously a few things, but. One thing I did want to say uh, that that's important, uh, I think, to the question that you uh, asked about um, our role in ending mm -hmm. uh, the norms mm -hmm. that have been established. Um, I think one thing that's super important um, is to hire our hi our our hiring practices. Um, you know, hiring women or uh, or you know gender non-binary folks in our not just in our institutions but in our bands. Uh, because I know, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to have this kind of um, awareness and knowledge and, you know, doing, you know, the work in, in educating and being more, I, what I see is uh, people being more conscious about it with um, how they educate and uh, their hiring practices in that way, but not as much on the bandstand. So I think that that's something that all musicians could really um, stand to look at and do better with um, and also mentoring uh, really look at the um, the importance of that because it's an apprentice art form um, and mm -hmm. I think that if that commitment was made just that it would make a world of difference um, with gender representation you know real really like really committing you know to, to mentoring um, and hiring Absolutely. Or changing our practices, you know, in yeah. that way. Yeah, absolutely. And we can all do that. And we can all um, consider and do that. And I think you dropped out. I, I was literally mentioning to Maureen and some more that I had I had that blind spot for a long time. Um, thankfully, no more. But <laughs> about, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all, I think most of us, you know, most women that um, want to be taken seriously ha had that blind spot mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. some still do because that's what we're taught, you know, kind mm -hmm. of back to what Maureen said. If, if I want to be taken, Mary Williams was the perfect example too, you know, she wanted to be taken seriously. So she didn't want to mess around with any women. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, you know, she rejected it. I rejected it for years. Yeah. You know, and uh, anyway, we all, you know, come to things when we're supposed to, I guess, but hopefully we're helping people come to them a little quicker. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I just, to just kind of, just to piggyback a little bit what you're saying, Terry, this idea of, um, cause, and also what Maureen's been talking about, such as the, you know, the female voice and, the, and vocalist, um, there's also this thing, and that I took a lot of pride in, um, being a vocalist that was taken seriously by musicians and liking the divide for a while you know mm. check that yeah. out like liking exactly. the divide oh, right absolutely, so, absolutely. yeah you know? I, I relate <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know and uh and then for it was like you know again looking at it was like, like that divide is not all that divide is not okay not at all. um you know but yeah you know so just yeah. real, real talk real talk yeah no I, absolutely i challenge you know every woman that that uh is, 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 you know, doing it successfully, however that, whatever that means, but yeah. th that re re rejects some of this. I really challenge them to look at that because yeah. to me that saying that they um, like being the exception. And I think um, yeah. we know that, that we now know, maybe we didn't before, but uh, we now know that there's something wrong with 
being an exception. Absolutely. And, and there's something also, wrong with the rule. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that yeah. we're an exception means exactly. there's a rule. Absolutely. You know? And 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 in, like and sort of, you know, wanting to be taken seriously with from the male gaze also. Exactly. So wow. Um is any I would love to wow, this is this is just a really exciting conversation and so important. Um, really touching on things that I don't, I, I don't get personally get to hear discussed often enough and, and going to, to a certain depth. So I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate how open everyone has been to share and to go into, um, to go into these spaces of, of discussion that are really necessary for everyone who's joining us in Zoom and, on, on, and um, to hear. So I wanted to know if anyone, if you, if we should move on to a, another question, um, or is there something more anyone wanted to contribute to what we've been talking about? The more, please. I don't know how this related this is, but I, I do. I have a random thought that I just I forget things quickly. So I, <laughs> I, think, I think one thing that um, I I think is also important and might seem like a little bit of a departure, but thinking about, you know, something that Maureen said that made me think of, of adding this was that she, she spoke about institutions, right? And I think that oftentimes it becomes a, a conversation about individuals and the institutions get left out when really it, it does, it is a, an individual conversation about, as Terry said, you know, starting with the self and really dealing with that. But there's also this challenging institutions part um, and also building new ones, which is what, you know, why I'm, I'm so appreciative of what um, Terry uh, and Asian others have built. Um, and on the subject of challenging institutions, I think one, one reason why the ins challenging institutions is so important is that because the institutions can become the reason actually that we don't change because then we just rely on the institution to solve things or to handle things, which they're not built to do. And that takes us out of the picture. And the, 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 the example I will use is the prison system. And this is an important example to me, again, as an abolitionist, because um, number one, there's, I think, that, uh, I think that something that we have to confront, and this might be a controversial opinion with some people, with some people but, is the fact that I think a lot of folks believe that um, a lot of folks have a lot of faith in the policing and prison systems to solve gender-based violence. And they don't do that at all. They do not do that. I mean, we could tell, because it exists, still exists <laughs> a lot, you know, as we as we know. And so as a result they don't realize that the only way to get rid of those things is for us to eradicate the ways that they exist in our society. Mm -hmm. And they, we, mm -hmm. we don't take it upon ourselves to do that work, to be a part of challenging and you know, confronting those in our community who we know are per perpetuating that stuff and being like, I'm not gonna be cool with you. I'm not gonna let you get away with that. Um, and, and it's also, part of what upholds the prison system because that always gets that always becomes the last line of defense for the prison system is like oh yeah you know we get it about the drug offenses and we're cool to let them folks out but what about the people that commit gender-based violence and that becomes the argument for upholding the prison system when in reality when you look at when you look at the numbers policing in prison actually makes gender-based violence worse and so the only solution is to solve, solve it. The only solution is to actually dismantle the systems and change the institutions. That's the only way that we're gonna get there, right? And so I think that a lot of times we can end up passing the buck, so to speak, and being like, because I'm not the guy that commits gender-based violence, then I'm good. I'm not participating in that, you know? And I'm gonna let folks handle it and trust that the system will, you know, take care of those folks. And it's not mm -hmm. what the system does. So 
have a, I just have a question for you some more. When you say gender-based violence, um, can you be a little bit more specific? I mean, do you mean domestic violence? Do you mean, um, can you be a little bit more specific what you mean when you say gender-based violence? Um, for myself, but also for whoever's listening, just so it's really clear what you mean. And if you can talk a little bit about the connection of that to the carceral system, that would be great. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be triggering because I know that, you know, I, I, I know that certain things that people have experienced, you have to be very careful, you know, when you're not in charge of the space to make sure that you're not, you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I use that term. Well, you know, a, you brought it into the space, I know, right? I know, so. I know that term, <laughs> but I, I was hoping that it would be open enough that, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to. to no, no, it's totally, specific. but I just, I just want to understand. But, but what I will say what you is mean, that, you know? yeah. I do think that, you know, I mean, I think that uh, the, I guess the way that I'll, that I'll answer that is number one, I guess what I'm talking about is yes, physical violence, not always intimate violence, but often intimate violence, a lot mm -hmm. more than we talk about. Um, meaning, it, you know, as you would call it domestic, I would call it intimate violence. Um, and, you know, this is definitely something that we, I believe is under talked about during the pandemic times because it's cats who have to freaking be in house with people that don't, you know, are, are being, that they shouldn't be in the house with. Um, but, um, you know, it's also, it also shows up in other ways. You know, um, I think that it can be restricted to that, but that there are a lot of psychological and um, emotional ways that violence can be enacted too. So it's, I'm not just talking about physical, but, Really what I'm trying to say is that uh, I think I think what I'm trying to say is that, uh, this is what I'll say, uh, sorry. Um, the system of patriarchy is at base about domination. That's what men are taught to do is dominate. That's what the system has taught us to do as men. And so until we deal with that, until we deal with the fact that power equals domination in American society and that we've been inundated into that as men and that that shows up in all different types of ways for us. And that we know we don't challenge that when we see other men doing that, then we will not actually dismantle the repetitive practice of domination. Okay, I think I, I, think I got you now, yeah. Thank you some more. Maureen or Terry, do you want to say answer any answer to that? Or respond to respond to some more? Okay. I, I actually wanted to ask about another, a different institution, or um, if I if I can. Um, sure. Because I I I know some of the people on the call are very familiar with the Institute for Jazz and Gender Justice. But I think it, it is a way to, you know, talk about another kind of institution uh, and um, the idea of building institutions. And I wonder, Terry, if you could just talk a little about um, what you're doing there, because I think, I mean, when I first heard that this was happening, I was, I was amazed that someone had the nerve to put jazz and gender justice together in a, in a title. Uh, for a place of learning. And so it's, it's, it's like such a revolutionary thing to do. It's not putting the gender stuff off to the side, but it's making it, it integral. So I just wonder if you could talk about um, how you came to this and some of the work that you're doing uh, at the Institute. Well, I can't take uh, but so much credit for the name because um, I, I was, deliberating on the name for quite a while. And I was thinking gender equity and um, Dr. Angela Davis said, no, you have to use the word justice. And, um, you know, explain to me that you can have equality and equity without changing the conditions that created the inequality and inequity in the first place. And if you use the word justice, it implies transformation. And when she said that, it was kind of like one of those moments that <clears throat> you know how you uh, may have grown up with Christianity and something just didn't 
feel exactly right. And then you heard, you know, uh, you, you read something about Buddhism or, or Islam and then that spoke to you and you're like, that's what I've been wanting to. I mean, so for me, it was like that kind of moment where I wasn't, you know, I knew I wanted, you know, equity as well, but I, I, I didn't know why I was a little resistant to using that term. And, um, you know, she really made me see, you know, that, that there's a lot in the name. Um, I didn't want people to think that we were doing like any form of uh, gender studies because we're not. Um, it's really a performance based um, program. We're looking to expand more um, and, and have uh, more liberal arts classes or you know other other things that are non performance based. But for now, um, we do have one class that Asia teaches uh, jazz, gender and society. Um, but that's open to um, all the students at the school, not just the Institute students. Um, what we do is just really kind of your more basic Institute model of um, having guest artists come and, um, you know, having kind of an intensive uh, performance experience more than you might get um, just as a performance major. Uh, we do a once a week um, gathering, which also brings guests to speak about different topics. And we do auxiliary lessons. Um, and we're talking now, we have a couple of more classes that we're forming now. But what I was more amazed at, so my intention in the beginning was just to provide a safe and nurturing space. Um, and I didn't want it to be confused with like a women's institute. Uh, because I always recognized that this work of, of gender justice and gender equity is the work of everybody. And I just didn't want it to feel like uh, something that people would assume, oh, that's just an institute for women. Like we're off in a silo working on this issue by ourselves. So um, <clears throat> I was you know, very encouraging to young male students uh, to, to join. So I think, you know, maybe the first semester or two, there weren't so many young men that applied. And I, I feel like they might've been concerned with, you know, what the other guys would think. Um, but we've, it's only been four or five semesters. And now I have to make sure that I'm keeping it equitable <laughs> because there's so many young men that want to, want to be in this institute. Um, you know, which is cool because they're they're forced to uh, look at it within themselves. But what we've come to understand is they're tired of this kind of perf um, perf performative masculinity, um, and it's so refreshing, you know, to see so many young men that are like, yeah, that we weren't down with that anyway, and found ourselves doing it, <laughs> you know. So um, it creates a space for them too, which is really important, I think, to acknowledge. Um, and but the one thing that I, and I'll, I'll stop, I know I've been talking for a minute, but the one thing that I didn't expect um, that has happened uh, quite a lot is that all the other departments um, at the school, they, they've all started to um, lean on us a bit or, um, you know, ask us to bring this kind of um, way of thinking to their departments. And uh, so, you know, we're so busy all the time and it's not just about our institute, it's about, you know, the entire college and also other institutions outside of the college. Um, so it's great because everybody seems like they want to be in this conversation now. And, you know, I'm, I'm really happy uh, about that. And um, I think that I see, um, I see glimpses of, of real change occurring. And um, I, I didn't expect to see it quite so soon, um, but it's also a movement, you know? So that's what happens with movement. So I'm more energized and more, you know, because in the beginning I'm thinking, oh man, do I really want to do this because it's just like, is this an uphill battle or, or what, you know? But um, I'm, I'm actually more energized than I ever thought I'd be. Uh, because so many people, uh, it's just so many things opened up, you know, just by creating this space. Wow. Um, 
th thank you. Thank you, Terry, for really going into um, what the Institute of Gender, and Gender Justice is about. Um, that was actually the question, the personal question I have for you, Maureen. Thank you for, um, for, for, for doing that and asking the question and for really sharing with us what's, what's going on and how successful um, it's been already. Um, but it is pretty amazing. Um, when I first heard that you had started the Institute, um, yeah, just oh, blown away. I just wanna say one thing like, um... You know, Imani, most of us know Imani. And I remember when we did, um, I forget it was a re not a reception, but. Um, like a round was, table? No, well, I, my, my brain, uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came, yeah, she it had, a, it was a day of events we did. And it wasn't a symposium, but it was a, another word, a open house maybe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she came and, um, she, when she walked in and she saw Jazz Without Patriarchy. And this was really something that um, touched me, but also made me see the importance of the work that we're doing. She started mm -hmm. crying. And she said, just walking into a space and seeing that on, you know, on the wall. She, and she, you know, she spoke yeah. you know, as well, but she started crying. And um, I, that's when I really knew that um, yeah. this is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Because yes. it made her think about her grandmother, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's all of this, all of the legacy burdens, you know, that we've uh, I'm all been carrying. Um, so yeah, I think we all have different uh, ways of dismantling. You asked about how do we dismantle? I think every day, every breath, <laughs> you yeah. know, at a time, the words we say, the actions we talk, I mean, everything starts with thoughts, words, and deeds, you know, so. Right. Um, and conversations like when older jazz musicians call me um, and say, I guess I've been an old fart. I mean, one guy, I'm using his exact words. He said, I never, you know, and, and the other thing that keeps coming is people say, I never really thought about it. Yeah. And so that say two years ago, but now if somebody says, I'm not hearing that as much now, you know, I never really thought about it. Because if you say that now, you know, somebody's gonna look at you a little cross-eyed. <laughs> yeah, because, you've been. Yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. It's, it's really um, great to see, you know, things changing that way, but more, uh, you know, as I said before, people on stage and more mentoring still has to really happen. Yeah. Academic space is one thing and it's an important space. Um, and it's important because it turns out so many musicians. So we have to really, I think, address academic space on mm -hmm. uh, racist practices and sexist practices mm -hmm. so that uh, more opportunities happen so uh for uh you know african-american musicians women black women specifically um uh, and change what's you know moving into the professional world from academia yes well wow, thank you and you know if i can just add a little bit that representation is, is everything i mean i think when you talked about imani's response you know it's like walking into space and feeling like I belong here, no questions asked kind of thing. You know? How often do we get to feel that? You know? Beautiful. Um, I wanna ask another, we, we're gonna probably start opening up the floor for questions in, in a few minutes. And, um, and I just wanted to ask um, uh, just a question. It's actually a, a two part question, but I'll just put it all together. Um, it's, for, it's again for everyone. Um, most of you have sort of both all of you have sort of touched on this, but just just to kind of I think everyone listening would, would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, and as what are each of you considering I have already put in motion to move this discussion forward proactively, either personally or more broadly? And what other communities can we collaborate with around these issues? And I know some of some of you know some of this has been sort of talked out, but um, but just as a, to kind of close it off, and yeah, I would love to hear your feedback, your response to this. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just say a few things about that real quick. Uh, of course, you know, like Bryce mentioned in the beginning, um, key change and presenters, you know, that's an important, you know, community to address this issue. Um, 
I'm thank you, you know, to Winter Jazz Festival for, um, you know, having this kind of handled in some ways, right? Since 2017, so that's yeah. that's amazing. Um, press, uh, you know, publications, uh, who they give their platform to, um, radio, the same thing. Um, I have conversations with, you know, I'm the type of person that you know speaks to people one on one. Um, I'm more comfortable. I'm very comfortable one on one, and um, so if I talk to program directors, you know, I know that I've done my job when they say I can't program our radio show without um, hearing your voice in my head, you know, and that's when I know I'm winning. Um, so I think though, you know, we have to have, you know, it's kind of grassroots, right? Having these conversations mm -hmm. with uh, radio programmers um, when we go to when we're traveling again, hopefully. <laughs> sooner than later, you know, we go to do our gigs in other towns. I think it's important to you know, carry on these conversations in local communities outside of our own, outside of, you know, New York or, you know, I live in Boston, but in small towns and, you know, people that may not have the same exposure um, as people in New York um, and having the patience and, and, and um, you know, be willing to do that kind of labor in these communities that where the conversations may not be as easy, where we're not necessarily preaching to the choir. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, just, I think this online community that we're experiencing, um, because, you know, we, we're thinking, you know, community now has changed so much, you know, even just in this last year, uh, so it's become a lot more global um, than, than it was. So I think that we have to maintain this online community even when we're back, you know, to, uh, because I think we're really seeing uh, the impact that it, it can have. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, c to continue these types of conversations in, in this online space is important too. Oh, thank you, Terry. Maureen or, or Samora, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think, well, I mentioned in terms of what I hope I'm putting in motion is has to do with teaching. Um, and so saying that I teach uh, college students, I think we're all aware that um, music education at the elementary school level has really been decimated, um, you know, in the last few decades. And so I think one of the one of the things we talk about in our department is how are we going to have more music majors when so many Kid, little kids aren't getting music education. You know, when are they going to get that exposure? So I think something we need to think about, um, and I don't know how to do it, but one collaboration would be some way of reaching um, young people, um, mm -hmm. both in terms of playing instruments, but also music appreciation, because we want to have audiences for the musicians who are training at, you know, at Berkeley and the new school in NYU. And so uh, just doing something, working with nonprofits and foundations to try to bring more music education into the schools and to have it be this, um, a music education that is about gender justice. Um, I think that would be really powerful so that the next generation coming up uh, we'll have that open mind that we're, we're talking about. Wow, I think that would be amazing to have school music come back to the schools. Yeah. Uh, wow, yeah. Thank you, Maureen. Samora, is there anything you'd like to add before I... Sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of individually, what I'm trying to do, and, and I guess I would extend this to trying to I hope I see more of this, but you know, going back to the to the music, uh, to to you know, I'm somebody that I think a lot about. Uh, I mean, we've all talked about language in this context, and you know, being inside of a of a of a tradition that you know it does definitely include a lot of um, music without words, but there's also a lot of music with words, and I particularly you know make music with words, um, and so for those of us who make music with words. Um, you know, talk about this stuff in the music. Um, I think I think one of the observations I've made, or I don't theorize, maybe this is totally off base, but um, I think 
one of my observations has been that when folks make music, they tend to heroize themselves in the music and particularly um, men. So they either talk about things that they've been victim to, or they talk about, they place themselves at the center of the narrative in the context of, you know, a certain way in which even as they may deal with faults, and this is not just music, but art in general, I think it shows up a lot in the, in the film space too it becomes that they still tend to be heroized by the end of the narrative. And I'd be, much, I'd be very interested to, uh, for, for men to have more courage to talk about the things that they need to deal with and do it in the music. Be honest about that in the music. Be more honest about the things you do in the music and the ways you're trying to work that out um, and not just the things that are done to you. Um, and so that's something I'm trying to practice and we'll see how that goes um, this year. Um, and uh, I think as far as, um, as far as the, the, the big picture stuff um, institutionally, um, I think that this is not just set into specifically, um, this is not, this is a conversation and I think, you know, uh, Mari mentioned, you know, intersectionality. This is a, an intersectional frame, but um, I would, I, I would love to see and be part of more collectives mm -hmm. outside of the capitalist individualist model, because I think that that model keeps mostly men, mostly white men in power. That model keeps money away from musicians and keeps them from helping each other. Um, that model. Um, is a part of why uh, our industry is um, so uh, controlled by the labels who are all not good in, th in th these areas. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I would like to participate in more collective frameworks. And um, one of the ways that I, that I, one of the examples I draw on that's outside of music but I've been thinking about a lot is the Kitchen Table Press, which was started by women, um, including Audrey Lord, many from um, the Kambahi River Collective, which I mentioned. Um, and that was a collective um, book label. I don't know, that's not the word for it, but you know, um, in which they, you know, uh, retained ownership of their work. And also, you know, it was a collective ownership, co publisher, thank you. So he put the chat. Um, but anyway, so I'd like to be a part of some of those kinds of reimaginings of collective ownership, um, collective process, and collective accountability. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm assuming you've heard of the AACM and yes, the, you know, sort of bag and sort of musician collectives that um, that also had sort of really special models about working together and um, you know certain you know ideas about process and how how the work would be created. So. Um, but I, I, I love that idea of thinking about developing collectives and sharing work and, um, and sharing ideas. Yeah. Well, I want to thank um, Maureen. Maureen Mann, if it's someone just going to say your, your um, full name is Maureen Mann, Terry Lynn Carrington, and Samora Pindahuse for a truly delightful conversation. I mean, maybe the word delightful is not really appropriate. But I've enjoyed having, um, well, delightful in that the subject matter is, um, um, when we're talking about language, the, the word delightful brings up a certain connotation, something on the light side. And, um, but it was really a riveting and, and powerful conversation. And I think the more, more appropriate words to, to say. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor now to some questions and, um, and Sarah is going to help um, feel some of those as she mentioned, and here she is. Hey, everybody, I'm back. <laughs> a little darker over here. Um, we've got a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump right into it. So the first question that we have is specifically for Maureen, and it's from Bertrand. Um, his question is, who are some of the rock musicians that you have studied? He put this in the chat a while back um, toward the beginning of the conversation. Um, I, my first book, I focused on the Black Rock Coalition, which is a, you could think about as a musician's collective. Um, so I was talking about Living Color, Michelle and Diego Cello, 
um, those were Dave Fusinski. Um, those are the musicians who were really active at the time I did my research in the mid 90s. But because it was black rock, I also spent a lot of time talking about Jimi Hendrix. And then in my new book, I'm talking about African American women in rock and roll. And I talk about Big Mama Thornton, who precedes the label rock and roll, and then Laverne Baker, the Shirelles, um, LaBelle, and Betty Davis, and Tina Turner. So those are the the main figures I talk about. And thank you for the question. I'll say too that Maureen, you have some great um, interviews online where you speak very specifically and in depth about your work. So if you're interested, you know, we don't have, we don't have enough time. This conversation could be six hours and <laughs> we still wouldn't have enough time. So please look Maureen up in online and check out some more interviews. Um, and also your, your work, um, your books, um, the books that you've, you've had published, check out all of Maureen's work. Um, the second question is from E. Joyce, also from Zoom. Um, and it kind of speaks to the conversation around press and the steps that press can take in relationship to this conversation, as Terry was mentioning not too long ago. Um, e. Joyce says, I have been discouraged in my expression of writing jazz reviews by a successful male jazz critic, referring to my writing as being too flowery which feels like a sexist way of looking at things, that women are somehow not to be taken seriously for a stereotype of being poetic as if this is a detriment. Jazz writing has been very male, more analytical, dry, and there is no room for more musical intuitive writing and interpretations. I was quite surprised and also saw that it might keep women from pursuing this sort of writing. There's not a question in there, but I wanted to share that statement from E. Joyce um, just for folks to respond to, because it feels like there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, um, well, what I would say is that, yes, that does definitely sound sexist. The other thing is I, I actually, I really love uh, the way you put that, particularly um, because what it comes to mind for me is that uh, as far as you talking about, you know, the the, the language that is, uh, codified or allowed in the context of the of the of writing about the music, which is very interesting to me that the writing would not reflect the music, right? So the writing not reflecting the spirit of the music in that space that is poetic, that is, um, you know, thinking about. And I, I, there are writers like that. I mean, there are, you know, I I think about Saidiya Hartman as a, to me, a, a writer in our tradition, um, you know. And, and other writers like Teju Cole, Fred Moten, obviously, but um, but as far as like the the writing that's about you know the the subject, um, it doesn't tend to make space for that kind of writing. So I think that that's a very interesting thought, and I hope that space will be made for that kind of writing. As far as um, you know, speaking to the the male dominated critical space, uh, I mean, I would just say yes, that's true, and just like. Uh, Terry spoke about radio and did mention press. That's definitely something that has to be that has to be changed, and I think that's in uh, that's in general across not only the musical form but across all all art forms. There has to be more non-white male writers. Period. Um, you know, I, I just want to add to that um, <clears throat> because it's the same thing. You know, when it comes to the performance of the music. Um, you know, the sound that we're used to, uh, what, what has established what jazz is, um, has been quite absent. Uh, well, the feminine aesthetic is what I'm trying to say has kind of been absent from it. And to the point that um, some people, if, you know, so, some male musicians, you know, played a certain way, some people may feel that, you know, they have too much of that and uh, don't relate to their playing, you know, whereas maybe the people did and the person sold a lot of records, but it, it, it or maybe they thought women bought the records, you know what I mean? This whole thing about um, this feminine aesthetic, you know, in, in music. Um, so when you talk about writing, um, she said uh, too flowery and things like that, it's, it's in parallel with the actual mm -hmm. performance itself. So that's why when, if we say, uh, you know, what does it sound like jazz without patriarchy? We, we don't know what it sounds like because that aesthetic has not been, um, you know, really uh, accepted, you know, so much in the music. So it's the same thing, exact same exact thing with the writing. So that, that was, you know, um, the first time I really thought about 
that, you know, as far as how the writing is actually, you know, in parallel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've also talked to musicians who have spoken about the idea of the gender spectrum in relationship to this conversation. And it's kind of aligns with what Samara was saying earlier, essentially the idea that, you know, all of us ex exist if we're willing to accept it on a spectrum of gender identity. Um, and that if we actually tap into the uh, the various elements of that spectrum, our musicality and our creative space can expand um, immeasurably <laughs> because, we, and the sounds that we'll be able to make and the things that we'll be able to create if we embrace not only the male part of our, each of our identity and the female part of each of our identity, but the entirety of that spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Maureen, was there anything you wanted to add to that? There's some other questions, so I'm gonna keep, okay, I'm going. All right, this next question is from um, Hobart. Um, Hobart says, David Boykin in Chicago once said that he prefers playing in bands with both men and women because there is a better energy balance. Do you have any thoughts on this? That's a, this is a multi-part question. Um, I'll, I can repeat these two. The second part is, is there a freedom for all people to be open to the range of gender in themselves by playing and, and community, communing together? Um, and the third part is, do any of the panelists have an example that comes to mind? Um, and David specifically is uh, speaking too about the spiritual balance as well, allowing for all artists to open to the mul multiplicity of gendered experiences. And us all, how appropriate this is. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Well, the only thing I'll say to that answer to, well, that's a multiple, it's just, of course. I mean, of course. Um, <laughs> Of course, um, I mean, as, as comfortable as one feels to expose and to sort of, you know, tune into all the aspects, those aspects of oneself, um, of course, it's valid to, to, um, to, to have that in the music. That's, that's, I mean, for me, it's, a, to me, it's a very, it's a pretty simple answer. Yeah. I love the last question, though. Do any of the panelists have any examples that come to mind? And I wonder if anything comes to mind either in your own experience or in experiences that you've been a part of or witnessed. Well, I, mean, I, I um, oh, okay. Okay. No, go for it. Um, I don't know if this. I don't know if this will count as an experience, but um, I once I, I once did a record. I'm, I'm of Caribbean ancestry, and I once did a record um, where I did the entire record in dialect. And there was a reviewer um, who, when he reviewed the record, he, he gave it a good review because he liked everybody else on it but me. And what he, but which is fine. Um, the point I'm bringing it up is because he literally knew nothing about what the project was about. He, and he said this, he said, I know nothing about this, but nonetheless, I'm gonna judge it anyway. Um, and what bothered me about it is I, I really thought I was doing something expansive. Um, in one piece, for example, I was ch actually channeling a deep, like a, like a Shango. Shango uh, was actually channeling um, and trying to sort of emulate that with my vocal instrument. Um, and that's actually a non-gendered um, entity, one can say, right? So, um, so like, but it was just interesting that the reviewer didn't even bother, he, you know, he just didn't care to learn anything about what this work I was doing and, and was honest about it in the, in the actual review. So that's for an example of sort of trying to explain those sort of at, at the same time having press kind of be very dismissive and just honestly like, you know, I don't know about this and I don't want to know about it and it's horrible. Thanks for sharing that, Faye. Um, Terry, did you have something that comes up too? Yeah, I was just thinking about the, the question as far as the balance part. And um, I mean, I used to say that, uh, that it made sense, you know, to have a balanced stage because that's representative of, um, you know, the, the world we live in. Um, but I think I used to say it because I knew that was the correct thing to think or say. And uh, often when I played with women, I didn't feel, um, like the, whoever that person is uh, that said that they like the bands better when they're uh, balanced and it's like a spiritual uh, experience mm -hmm. or whatever the words were, um, that's very evolved. If, they, if I'm assuming they really mean that. So that's very evolved because um, we've been taught for so long what sounds good 
And, um, you know, for me, so many of the, the women that um, I might have found myself in a band with back in the day, especially, uh, didn't have those qualities always that I looked at um, that meant they were good. So often those qualities are strong, fast, loud. <laughs> I mean, you know, just the things that, um, you know, we hear, you know, just in a command of rhythm in a way that's just such an ownership of whatever rhythm is being played. Uh, like a command of it, like, I, I know I belong here. This is my stage, this is my space. And I don't, you know, I'm just gonna take it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So many of the women um, felt like they wanted to be invited in opposed to claiming it as their own and telling them, you know, having the attitude. So, I mean, for me, I had an attitude more with um, some of my male counterparts, like, you're not telling me, I'm telling you. <laughs> like that's, that was always my attitude. You know, I wasn't intimidated and I felt like this is my stage. So if you wanna get with this, you know, I'm gonna be right there with you. And uh, we, you know, we're in this together, but I, I started feeling, especially through teaching too, that a lot of the young women, um, they didn't have that kind of ownership mm -hmm. and um, that kind of, uh, what's another word? I, I, um, uh, 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 warrior spirit, you know, like that, that thing that is like, my, like, like play like my father used to say, play like your life depends on it. And that felt so, um, it's, when I look back, it feels pretty, you know, it kind of feels very um, like a male aesthetic in that way. Mm -hmm. Like if I wasn't drenched in sweat, you know, which is not, you know, typically ladylike, you know, then I felt like I wasn't playing yet. You know what I mean? So I mm -hmm. saw people that approached the music differently and the goal of being drenched in sweat was not there. So uh, my, my, my view of what sounds good and what you have to bring to the, to the stage, to the table uh, had to shift. So that I'm just saying that when you think about balance, all of those things have to come into play. You know, we have to shift our way of thinking um, just about, uh, you know, what, how people have been socialized. Yeah. You know, what's a lady like, what's not? I mean, I sit with my legs open at a drum set every day. You know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, um, just so all of those things, I think we have to, you know, just look at it's more than what, uh, surface more it's, it's not as surface as I think uh, we've been looking at it as a, as a group not us but yeah, yeah. but I wonder Thank if you. that if that attitude that you're talking about Terry if that that's part of what made you fit in but did it also create problems were you were you difficult you know that word that is always or often used to describe women who don't put up with a lot of crap or know what they, you know, what they're interested in and what they want and what they want to do. Right. I, I think that I somehow miraculously um, didn't really get labeled that because I think I naturally <laughs> have a bit of a soft spoken nature and mm -hmm. I can combine that like with a, a real what kind of, I don't know, ferocious nature too, uh, you know, especially at the instrument when it comes to the music. But if I'm speaking, you know, I don't really, uh, you know, yell or, you know what I mean? So I feel like I was the kind of woman that had that balancing act together and no one should have to. That's, I think the point, you know, yeah. uh, because I, I, I felt like one of the boys, but also, you know, a girl that was accepted by one of the boys. So it's a, that's a difficult balancing act. A, a friend mm -hmm. of mine talks about it like, the barbershop uh, balancing act that women have to do. If you can go in a barber a men's barbershop, a black men's barbershop and hang, you know, like you can't be too much, you know, you can't like maybe curse quite as much or as loud or as strong, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, you have to just to be able to hang in the barbershop is a feat. Yeah. And um, so I think, you know, it's the same thing with, with jazz musicians because mm -hmm. I could hear, um, them speak about other women and fall into that myself. You know, feel like I could make my, uh, you know, similar opinions about other women because they didn't necessarily fit into 
this thing that I somehow fit into. But then I started to realize that no one should have to, you know, not be their authentic self, whether whatever that is. Thank you all. Um, I've got a question here from Mark. Um, Mark's question is, are there areas of the world that are more advanced in jazz and gender? Uh, ellipses, Europe, question mark. Uh, well, I've lived in Europe um, for a long time and it's interesting. Oh, that's, that's complicated. Um, if I'm really honest, I will say this. For the period that I lived there, um, no man ever asked me, I traveled a lot, I toured a lot, no European man ever asked me, was my husband or boyfriend okay with me being on the road? It never came up. No one ever asked that question. I've been asked that question a lot when I'm here. Yeah. So, yeah, it's complicated. I would say in a lot of ways, I felt just part, you know, if I was accepted musically, that was, there was no more just really discussion and it was cool. Much, um, I don't want to like, but I'm similar to Terry in that I was also a bit of a worry about this stuff, you know, when I was starting out, I just like, you know, um, and, and I felt like that was a little tougher here, especially because I'm a vocalist than when I was lived in Europe. I'll just say that. That's just a personal experience thing. Thanks for sharing that, Faye. We have um, we have so many more questions, and we're definitely not going to get to all of them, which is unfortunate. Um, but I'll say that if you if your question doesn't get answered here, feel free um, to comment on the uh, on either Winter Jazz Fest, the Institute of Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, or the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music's Facebook page, because the the events are going to live up there, and we'll try to engage um, in the chat with more questions. But I'll I'll keep going. Maybe we can do a few more. Um, this next uh, comment and question is from Eilish. Hi, from New Zealand. I'm a saxophonist and often play baritone. As a woman, I find myself in situations after gigs where I get comments from audience members. One of the ones I get the most is, wow, that's a big saxophone for such a small woman. How do you even play that? What would be your suggestion or suggestions on how to respond to comments like that? I don't I don't know that I'm qualified to answer this because you know as a man I have never been well and you know what both as a man and as a pianist I have never been asked anything about uh any of that but I mean I'll tell them that off personally <laughs> but you know I mean, <laughs> you know if the, if they disrespect you then you know that's that's that but I understand that sometimes you have to be civil or it happens quickly so you know I would just say you know don't let anybody take your power away from you based on their BS. So however you feel like you need to handle it in order to empower yourself and, and go home and, and do your thing, do that. That's not to say that it won't hurt because things hurt and it's important to acknowledge that too. So I'm not saying just brush it off or anything, but I'm just saying, you know, however you feel you need to handle it, you should just handle it that way. Even if that means walking away. Yeah, you know what I mean because I think that sometimes it's le it's, it's laborious to have to educate sure. people. Sure. Yeah. So sometimes you know, like it ain't even worth it. Yeah, just get yeah. up and leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much for those responses. It's so important, and it's crazy how common it still is. Um, all right, I think we have time for for one more. This is a question from James, specifically for Maureen. Um, I think it was in response to what you were saying earlier, Maureen. So forgive me, we're kind of circling back again, but isn't, a sound, isn't sound a construction? And are we not in danger of putting it in a binarial mode, especially relative to gender fluidity? Well, I don't, I don't remember. It does sound like it was a response to something specific that I said. Um, and I mean, in, Ethnomusicology, we talk about how there's no single definition of music. Um, so if you go, go to different places in the world, different ways of organizing sound might be understood as music. 
in a way that we who are you know trained in the west live in the west don't recognize so i i would definitely say that you know music is a social construction and what we understand is music is a social construction um i think there is something real about sound uh if we're talking about sound waves and um things like that so i'm i'm not sure exactly what james was hearing and, and what i was saying but i'm I'm one who believes in social construction, so there's probably a way that we could talk about, you know, sound. Noise is, is another social construction. Um, I think it's important to remember that this, this Black music that we're talking about was heard as noise, uh, you know, in the 18th century, 17th century, 19th century. It was not heard as music. Um, and we've learned to hear it as music now, but it wasn't understood as music at the, at the beginning. Of course, the people who were making it knew it was music, what we would call music, but outsiders didn't think so. Thank you, Maureen. You know what, we have two questions, two more questions left. Can we do like a rapid fire? I'm gonna throw these out and we're just gonna try to respond quickly and just to, just to be able to, to honor these people's questions. Um, the first one's from Elisa. Elisa says, can being in a space without men be a revelation that throws the patriarchy in ourselves into relief? I'd say yes. Yeah, does anyone want else wanna add anything? I say rapid fire and then I ask that question. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. I think the short answer is yes. And I love how you said that, Elisa, the patriarchy in ourselves into relief. I love that, the use of those words. Um, and the last question is from Selena. I've noticed a rise of groups, mostly with male band leaders, using female fronted as a genre. As pleasing as it is to see more bands diversifying their ensembles, this term still has an underlying sexist tone and is also, it also feels exclusive, not providing space for non-binary or trans folks. How does the panel feel about this terminology? Um, I'm, I'm personally not a fan of the way anybody sells anything. So if that's the way somebody's selling something, then I'll probably have a problem with it. Um, <laughs> so that's the first thing. That sounds like a, a, a sale, pit, a pitch as they call it. Um, as far as, um, I guess, I guess part of what you're saying, I, I'm, as I'm understanding it, you're separating that from the construction of having um, bands that are all women, which I think can be very powerful. So it's, or you're, I guess you said male. So, so yeah, the term itself, I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I think the term itself doesn't seem to, like it holds any importance. I wouldn't have a problem not having it. I think there are many better terms. Maybe that's the best way to say it. Yeah, I'll just quickly add to just for a reminder that we don't often say male musician or male saxophonist or male, you know, so the fact that we put female in front of female vocalist, female instrumentalist, you know, we don't need that word, it, you know, we can just leave the gender language out of out of the equation, in my humble opinion. Um, Y'all, I want to thank you so, so, so much. This is going to be the quickest closing ever. Um, Faye Victor, Samora Pinder Hughes, Maureen Mann, Terry Lynn Carrington, I this has been such an amazing conversation as Faye you've already said many times it's kind of it's blown me away and been such an honor just being here and listening to you all um thank you thank you so much a huge thanks to Winter Jazz Fest to uh the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music at the New School and the College of P Performing Arts at the New School to the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice where I truly believe like this is going to sound kind of cliche but that we're stronger together. There are so many people that are approaching this discussion and these conversations from different angles. And this is the first time that three organizations and institutions who are doing it on different levels have come together for an event like this. And I know that Berkeley has something coming up later this year where you're gonna invite more folks into the conversation in, in the context of your space as well. Um, so be on the, on the lookout for, the, for more events that are coming up. As Bryce mentioned, Winter Jazz Fest talk series continues tomorrow, and we have our next two jazz and gender events. The next one is on February 11th, um, and that is around jazz, gender, and Black feminism. And then the event in March is on March 11th, um, and it is around reflection on gender bias, just like self-reflection that we've alluded to and talked about in this conversation. Um, so please mark your calendars, come back tomorrow. We will all be here um, in the audience cheering everybody on these conversations are so important so thank you really appreciate and sending so much love to all of you thank, thank you sarah you.
Thanks, Thank Sarah. you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Some more money, take you out. Thank you, everyone. Yay. It was great. Thank you. We'll take you out with some really beautiful music by some of these amazing humans. Take care, everybody.
Let the breeze in, I 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 let the breeze in, let the breeze in, I let the breeze in, I let the breeze in, I let the breeze in. Open the space up, fresh it, fresh it up, get that sage up. Light it, light it, spirit, light her out of here. Incense helps that. Keep that scent that smells to make you feel the air hit. Let it wake you up, let it wake you up, let it wake you up, let it wake you up. Let the breeze in, let the breeze in, I 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 let the breeze in, feel it on your own skin. Let the breeze in, I 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 let the breeze in, feel it on your own skin. Clear the dust out, smack away the webbing, open up the windows. Let the, let the, let the sun in. Let the flow go where it wants to, where it needs to. Let the flow go where it wants to, where it needs to. I let the breeze in, let the breeze in, I let the breeze in, I let the breeze in, let the breeze in, let the, let the, let the breeze, let the breeze in. Feel it on, I feel it on your own skin. Let the, I let the breeze in.
let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in, people. 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 Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Feel it. Feel it on your own, own skin. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Feel it on your own. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze in. Let the breeze.